Christmas is approaching and Britain wants a happy ending to a missing person story. He heard her phone ringing in her jacket pocket and I suspect that was probably the start of his nightmare. Joanna Yates would know her killer. His defence will be that her death was an accident. He put her hand around her throat and he squeezed and he squeezed the life out of her. As a nation mourned on Christmas Day, it was her family who were grief-struck. I do miss her. <laughs> December 17th, 2010. Office Christmas party time. Joanna Yates kisses her boyfriend Greg Reardon goodbye as he heads to Sheffield to visit his family. She then heads to a pub in Bristol. When she finished work, she joined workmates um, and she went out for a drink. She meets up with friends from her office where she works as a landscape architect. Joanna is very popular. She's really bubbly. She had this incredible warmth about her as well. Jo moved from Hampshire for her job, but regularly returns. She's part of a close and loving family. Probably a lot of mums say this, but she's a friend, um, someone I enjoyed time with, someone um, who inspired me to do perhaps more unusual things than, than other people do or that I would have done. Jo is like a breath of fresh air, really. Generally happy, and buoyant, very, very positive. Joanna and Greg, both in the city to progress their careers, have recently moved to a basement flat in the pleasant suburb of Clifton. Living upstairs, their landlord is Christopher Jeffries, a retired English teacher, never married, he lives alone. He has no TV, preferring to spend the time with his books. He's also heavily involved in the day-to-day -day running of the building and his flats. I had come to a point where one of the flats that I let out um, for retirement income became vacant. Um, the, the very first day that it was advertised, uh, two of the prospective tenants turned out to be Joe Yates and Greg Reardon. I liked them very much. I absolutely did nothing at all about them which was unattractive. Um, I liked both of them. They were young, enthusiastic, anxious to set up home together for the first time and I was very pleased to be able to give them the opportunity to do exactly that in what they obviously thought was an ideal place for them. I think both of them were enjoying building a house together, mm. you now acquiring the bits and pieces. Um, what young couples do. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they're very much a, 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 you know, a partnership. They're very much together. They're, just, uh, they're very happy together. The flat in Canning Road that they'd chosen to share was already home to Vincent Tabak, a young Dutchman also working his way up a career ladder. He left Holland for Britain after studying in Eindhoven. His expertise is in the field of people flow in public spaces. It's a specialised skill, much in demand in Britain. He grew up in a rural area of southern Holland. Uden is a very small town uh, in the south of the Netherlands. Very, very normal, very quiet, typical southern town where people celebrate carnival in February, very traditional. He was uh, this normal kid really he didn't have a lot of friends we know this that he didn't he didn't he played alone a lot of the times neighbors remember the youngest of four who has two sisters and a brother and they recall a pleasant quiet private boy just an ordinary guy as yeah 100 other guys <laughs> can be a little bit introvert uh, to himself uh, yeah i would say introvert yes Vincent becomes a student in Eindhoven in his late teens. He shines as a very good student, noted for his methodical, painstaking approach to problem solving. It's not easy to excel at this university, but he does. 
Eindhoven is officially the smartest region in the world and Vincent Tabak was one of the smart people. Vincent Tabak's work at university is not quite what it seems. Although he spends time plotting the movement of large groups, he spends little time with people. Instead, his is a virtual world lived largely in front of a computer screen. You know, it's maybe a little bit of a geeky university, very intelligent computer boys who sit behind their screens designing stuff. And, um, and maybe that was what he was doing for about seven or eight years while getting his PhD, is just being engrossed in his computer designing and, uh, you know, being very clever about it. Clever enough to be awarded his PhD. We know Vincent Tabak is a highly intelligent individual, that he's systematic in his approach to life. Like so many, he's never far from the web. Professionally, for work, he was a habitual user of the internet, as are many professional people. He used the internet to keep in contact with his girlfriend regularly. Tabak exudes different personas to different people. One minute awkward and preferring his computer screen for company, the next very sociable with those around him. He had always struck me and I think struck everybody else in the building as a thoroughly civilized and courteous person. He was a tenant who was in many ways ideal. It seems to be that different people describe him in quite different ways. So his family at home seemed to describe him as being quite shy, um, steady, calm, whereas his work colleagues in this country seem to describe him as being more outgoing. And these things are quite inconsistent. As Joanna heads towards the Ram pub, Vincent Tabak kisses his girlfriend goodbye. Vincent Tabak had also been at work. His partner, Tanya, had gone out to an office function that had taken her out of Bristol. And the plan was that he was going to pick her up in the early hours of the Saturday morning. He later tells friends that he took the opportunity to take pictures of the heavy snow that Britain was experiencing. At the Ram, Joanna shares a carefree seasonal evening. As ever, she's in demand the life and soul of the party. Everyone that knew Jo absolutely loved her. She was um, just full of life and energy. After a couple of hours, she prepares to leave. In the basement flat, which is adjacent to hers, Vincent Tabak is eating a pizza, drinking a beer. He sends a text to his girlfriend. Joanna heads off to pick up her supper, stopping first at Waitrose, but doesn't buy anything. She pops into a shop to buy two bottles of cider. Later, these mundane details, captured forever on camera, will become vitally important as police piece together events. At 20 to 9, she's in Tesco's, where coincidentally, she also buys a pizza. Between 8.45 and 8.50, Jo is in her flat, preparing her supper. Later that evening, Vincent Tabak is in a supermarket where he texts his girlfriend. He makes a point of telling her that he's missing her loads. It's boring without you. He formed an intention at some stage in that evening to go out to Asda. I frankly found that a bit weird. And he bought one or two items with some rock salt. Asda was in Bedminster. It's a car drive away from the flat. There are plenty of shops in Clifton. If you needed to pop out for something, I would have expected somebody to go locally, especially given the weather conditions. Returning home, he goes on to the web. Now alone, he checks his work emails and returns to a world others do not know he inhabits, a world of pornography. Clearly, scrape beneath the surface there was something about Vincent Tabak and his character and what he enjoyed viewing and doing that other people weren't aware of. He was looking at sites of violent pornography, um, the degrading of women, um, often sort of sadomasochistic practices um, including strangulation. We also know that when he was away from home, when he was in America, and more on a trip that he had in Newcastle, 
that he looked for escorts. That Friday evening, he was alone. Under the same roof, a landlord and two tenants who could not have been more different. The bookish academic, the bubbly landscape architect, and the young professional who leads an online life obsessed with violent sex, something he keeps very secret. The three lives are about to become inextricably and tragically linked. Greg Reardon is with family in Sheffield trying to get in touch with his girlfriend, Joanna Yates. Now over the weekend he tried to contact her, he tried to text her, he sent text messages to her, he also rang her number and he rang the landline and hadn't got any response. Greg grows worried. It's unusual for Joanna not to keep in touch. He travels back to Bristol and encounters an empty flat. When Greg got back to the flat on the Sunday, Joe wasn't there um, and he tried to contact her. He heard her phone ringing in her jacket pocket. And I suspect that was probably the start of his nightmare. The mobile phone went quite near midnight and Greg's name flashed up on it, which I thought was unusual. And uh, then he said, is Joe with you? And we said, well, no, why will she be with us? And then he said, well, all her belongings are here, her purse, her keys and things like that. I got up on the Monday morning, noticed that I had a missed call on my phone from Greg at about half past 12 on the Sunday. So that was very, very unusual. There was no rationale to it. And so we decided then that we'd drive down to Bristol and we um, asked Greg to phone the police immediately. And in the early hours of the following morning, as far as I can remember, he made the phone call to the police to say that his partner, Joe, was missing. Greg had already gone through the bag that she, that she used to carry around and found Joe's wallet, glasses, everything really. The only person, the only thing of Joe's which wasn't in the flat was Joe herself. What particularly strikes Joe's mum, Teresa, when she arrives at the flat is a receipt which tells her that Joe had bought a pizza earlier in the night. But there was no evidence of the pizza in the flat. There was no packaging. And the fact that her boots were left in the flat and her coat was there, her keys, her purse, her phone. So you already started to think there's something not right with this and this could be a criminal investigation. Something has happened to Joe. Joe's mum frantically searches the neighbourhood. We walked around the block just to sort of looking over walls to see either either the pizza or something to do with Joe or her clothes. And I remember sort of banging on boots of cars as well, just in case she'd been abducted and, and locked in. I mean, I knew there'd be no hope because it was so cold, but I, it's just not knowing what to do. It was bitterly cold, temperatures well below zero. At the house, signs of people who've walked on the lawn, Vincent Tabak and his girlfriend. I noticed these footprints going diagonally across the lawn, and I wondered where these came from. And I saw these two people, a shorter person and a taller person, walking along the same path, and I thought, ah, oh, they must have been the ones that caused it. As I was going to the flat, it stopped, and the smaller person was telling her, and she asked if she could help. And uh, the man stood well back away from the things, didn't say anything. The police quickly sensed the seriousness of events. In the case of Jo, it was highly unusual. She hadn't done this before. There, were, there didn't appear to be any um, personal issues that she had that would mean that she would, she would walk away from home and not tell anybody. She wasn't on any medication of any sort. She didn't have any mental health issues. She didn't have a history of depression. So all of the indicators that sometimes would call somebody to leave, leave home weren't there. So very early on, there was concerns for her. 
They scramble a media conference. If I had to pick a daughter, I couldn't pick anybody else. Good afternoon. And I miss her terribly. Firstly, can I thank you all for coming here today? I was frantically looking for bits of evidence when we got there. I mean, we s pockets, diaries, everything really. Really didn't know what to do, and no point in searching because there's so many areas around there. It's very difficult just sitting inside, waiting, 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 and not really knowing what was happening in the background. The police need help too. Who else lives in 44 Canning Road? Chris Jeffries. As landlord, he has the keys to Joe's flat. I came much more into contact with the police um, because I'm also the uh, secretary of the management company for the, for the whole building. Um, and there was a great deal to do in making sure that they had access to all the flats, including the flats uh, where the owners were not there um, at the time. Um, so yes, I was rather preoccupied with their requirements. Christopher Jeffries can have no idea how preoccupied he would become with the police. On the night that Joe had returned to the building, all Mr. Jeffries could say about his whereabouts is that he's alone reading. Downstairs, Joe's parents were now visiting Vincent Tabak's flat. His girlfriend seems keen to help, he less so. She was very kind and she said, yeah. is there anything I can do? Can we I think she said I, I don't know if she said we, but anyway, he definitely took a step back as far as he could get from the doorway. Vincent Tabak was very unusual. He was very organised, very calm and very rational, in that he's not caught up in the horror of the moment as everyone else would be. Vincent Tabak was spoken to for the first time by the police as a result of that call when they came round to take details treating it, as it was at that time, as a missing person inquiry. Tabak was soon almost bragging that he lived in the building which was at the centre of the news. Those who were close to Vincent Tabak, whether it was Tanya, whether it was work colleagues, whether, whether it was friends, there were friends that they met at dinner parties, you know, he convinced those that he had little or no knowledge of Joe that he knew nothing about a disappearance um, and he portrayed this image as actually he was a bit of a victim himself and that you know he was under stress and and he was concerned and he was doing his utmost to reassure Tanya we know through emails between the two of them that he was trying to reassure her and there was one instance of one dinner party when some of the female guests they were, were concerned about walking home and he walked them home he went back to work on the Monday. He was talking to people about the disappearance of his neighbour. As already arranged, he and Tanya um, travel um, up country to Cambridge uh, to have Christmas with her parents and then travelled across to Holland to have New Year with family and friends out there. Now Vincent de Back had left the Bristol area at the end of the 23rd of December. He was spending Christmas in Cambridgeshire with his girlfriend's family. And then on the 28th of December, he left the UK and traveled to the Netherlands through the Channel Tunnel. In Holland, Christmas celebrations are underway. It's eight days since the call to say that Joe was missing. Police continue the search for missing landscape architect Joanna Yates. The 25-year-old has not been seen since last Friday. Police are treating the case as a missing persons inquiry which are increasingly concerned with her whereabouts. They felt we were in a bubble. The whole world was sort of doing things, you know. Christmas well, it was Christmas Day, isn't it, you know. It was about quarter to nine on Christmas Day morning. Uh, Mr and Mrs Birch were walking their dog in Longwood Lane. 
and there was a, if I describe it as a mound underneath the snow uh, by, by a wall uh, with a quarry on the other side of the wall. And I think they walked past once and there was just something that wasn't quite right and they went back again and they could see, I think, an area of the jeans, Joe's jeans, exposed and thought is, I think that's a, that's a body of a human. We were talking about when we ever see, you know, we'll be dying without knowing what happened to Joe. And um, then we got the call on, on Christmas Day saying, you know, from the police saying, you know, Joe's body has been found, etc. It was relief because we we're absolutely certain by this time that Joe was no longer alive. I think. I would probably have spent quite a lot of time just looking. I think I would have possibly got a bit obsessive about it. Um, I don't know. I'm glad I wasn't in that position, really. No. The thing, when Joe's body had been found, it clarified a lot of things because Joe hadn't been sexually attacked. Well, it became a murder inquiry from that day yeah. because they knew how she... She hadn't just died. No. They knew... She'd been strangled. Yeah. And uh, then it turned then the, it turned into a rear who done up for the press um, because it was really was like a, a murder mystery. The hunt was now on for the killer of Joanna Yates. Joanna Yates had been killed at her home in Bristol. Police quickly recognised some key facts. There are no broken windows. No smashed doors. Joe was attacked by somebody that she had let into the premises. There was no sign of forced entry. It was somebody that she either knew or recognised. Chris Jeffries had had a conversation that same afternoon with Greg and he would have known that she was going to be there on her own that weekend. He uh, was landlord of the premises and we know he had a spare key. Chris Jeffries is interesting the media. They'd heard he may have changed his original statement to the police. He meets a reporter at the doorstep. He didn't immediately recognise that I was the person he was after, but as soon as he did realise that, um, he rather excitedly walked down the drive with me. Are you able to give us any detail of what I'm, it was you told them? I'm afraid not, no. I'm the only person who had any business asking questions that I might be in a position to answer uh, were the police, um, which I made uh, pretty clear to the reporters, probably in a slightly exasperated way. I'm not prepared to make any comments to the media. So you, okay? didn't, you didn't see her that evening? I certainly cannot say that um, I saw Joanna Yates that evening, no. Thank you very much. Christopher Jeffries had not changed his statement. He had added to it. He was trying to be helpful, but had become a person of interest to the police. I believe I had reasonable grounds to arrest Chris Jeffries. So I opened the door um, and was immediately confronted by two detectives who showed their ID, um, who announced, we're arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Joe Yates. Vincent Tabak is online following every detail of the case whilst in Holland. He now offers police remarkable new evidence. One thing he did do was make contact with the police while he was out of the country. And at 10 o'clock that morning, Vincent Tabak and his girlfriend made a telephone call to explain that um, he had remembered that his landlord's motor car had apparently changed direction overnight. He rang up with information stating that on the evening of the 17th of December, the person in custody who had a car parked to the rear of that premises in the communal parking area, 44 Canning Road, their car had moved.
that was significant for me as a senior investigator. And he knew the relevance of that. The bookish bachelor Christopher Jeffries was unaware that Tabak had incriminated him. Mr. Jeffries was now in custody being interrogated. I was invited um, to admit that on the particular Friday evening on which uh, Jo was thought to have disappeared, I had gone round to her flat, I had let myself in because as a landlord I had a key, and that um, everything had then um, escalated from that point. The car that Vincent Tabak had said Chris Jeffries must have driven the night that Joe went missing was painstakingly searched for forensic evidence. It was so intense as to be quite numbing. Jeffries had said that he'd stayed in reading that night. Had he lied? All the possessions that I had with me were taken away. His prized possessions, his books, were taken by police. I remember saying, what evidence do you have? Friends organised legal support as he underwent three days of questioning and spent nights in a cell. His way of life was snatched from him. I might have begun emotionally to, to break down. The conditions of being held in a police station are extremely stressful. But Christopher Jeffries was an innocent man. He was released without charge, so Joel's killer was still at large. Towards the end of the questioning, um, when it became clear that the police were not going to be able to find any ev evidence at all to charge me, then I did start to think, well, a lot of time has been wasted on an innocent person. Uh, whoever was responsible for Joe's disappearance and murder is still on the loose and remains a danger to the public. The public in Holland was only vaguely aware of the story. Bristol police knew that the man who offered damning but false evidence against Chris Jeffries had been alone in Canning Road the night that Joe disappeared. So I sent a team, two investigators out to the Netherlands to speak to him and his girlfriend as a witness to capture that information because I felt that was crucial to my investigation. At that meeting, one thing the police officers asked for was a voluntary DNA sample from Vincent Tabak. He was somewhat reluctant to do so. Um, sufficiently reluctant for the officer who took the sample actually to phone the incident room in Bristol and report that reluctance as being something that concerned her. It wasn't quite right. Vincent Tabak was now very much a person of interest to the police. It wasn't until the officers returned from the Netherlands and they spoke to Vincent Tabak on New Year's Eve that Karen Thomas, uh, the officer that spoke to Vincent Tabak and took the statement from him, raised some concerns. Those concerns related to Tabak's movements on the evening of December 17th, but more evidence was emerging. The police having had his DNA sample obtained voluntarily in Holland and checked against um, findings on Joe's body, discovered that his DNA was on her body. And that was one of the key factors that led to the planned arrest of him in later January. There was one man in England who thought the likeable Vincent Tabak could not possibly be guilty, his landlord. When Vincent was arrested, I was very surprised indeed because he certainly didn't strike me as somebody who um, I would suspect and I had some concern for him because I was worried that perhaps the police had made another mistake and somebody else had been unjustly um, taken into custody um, and I could imagine the same thing happening to him um, as happened to me and him going through exactly the experiences that 
I had had. Which is exactly the view taken in Holland, where local TV news reports detail his arrest. To journalists, there was every reason to suspect a miscarriage of justice being fueled by a frenzied British media. Dutch people were saying on internet forums, you know, if you would read that, they were saying, um, uh, well, he might be innocent. Uh, they arrested the landlord and he was innocent too. Uh, maybe the police are under a lot of pressure. You know, there, were, there was a lot of speculation going on and a lot of disbelief going on, a lot of doubt going on in the Netherlands about this man's guilt, yes. And in his hometown of Uden, similar support for a family now under siege from the British press. They were already under a lot of pressure because they didn't really understand why Vincent Tabak had been arrested. They didn't know anything about it. And of course they believed uh, their brother and their son to be innocent. They even went on television and claimed it. And it was just a, a British media circus around them that they weren't used to and that certainly Holland is not used to. The Tabak family is convinced that the media, focusing on Vincent alone, might ensure that he's found guilty. It's a seven o'clock in the morning live. They're convinced he's innocent. In Holland, the sort of coverage both Chris Jeffries and Vincent Tabak had endured is not allowed. One of the, the targets we had was to get the British press away from their houses, from their gardens, from their children, as they were in Holland already, um, very massively. So this kept going on and on and on. The more the press made noise about the story, the more the Tabak supported their son. They were fully convinced that he had nothing to do with it, that he was innocent. They knew him very well. He was uh, a very loving uh, brother and son and, and uncle. And for that reason, they were really in distress. I mean, they could not imagine that a guy like him was arrested by the, by the British police for a, a horrific thing like this. And how could he be guilty? He had a digital alibi. The text to his girlfriend, surely someone who'd killed could not be so cool, and he was captured by store cameras on the night that Joanna had disappeared. In Holland, Vincent Tabak was an innocent man. Now in custody, Vincent Tabak is being anything but helpful with police inquiries. When he was in custody, he made no comment. And initially when he was in custody, we had the forensic evidence, the DNA that I spoke about on her body, and the statement that he'd made to the police on the, on the 31st of December. He went no comment, but he gave a written statement, during which he stated that he didn't know Joanna Yates, didn't know anything about her murder. Police need to gather evidence. They search pictures from every street camera in Bristol. They find Tabak walking the streets, all very normal. At 10.30 p.m., he walks into a supermarket, but he walks back out and then inexplicably returns to buy some beer, rock salt and crisps. It's as if he wants to be captured on camera. He knows all about the design of public spaces. He knows where the cameras are. My view is that he made that trip to Asda to form an alibi if he needed it, an alibi for why his car was out, a route that he took where there was a lot of CCTV, the fact that he was making a text message underneath a CCTV camera. These were all things to put him out and about as an alibi. He kept in contact with his partner and sent what is now a particularly pertinent text to her at a time when Joe would have been dead. After his arrest, police forensically investigate Tabak's computer. They find evidence of a man with secrets. Well, there was um, a substantial amount of material found on uh, Vincent's laptop, um, which contained um, extreme pornography. Vincent's about to use of internet for porn and um, for a secret life it does seem to have been something that he protected um, and was hidden. As well as searches for pornography, police uncover Tavak's fascination with Joanna Yates' disappearance. 
very soon we identified that as early as the 19th of December at 10.30 that evening, he was on Google Maps at home on his laptop looking at Longwood Lane. What it showed was that he had an interest in the situation at a time when um, everybody else, Joe's family, partner and the police were still treating this as a missing person inquiry. Earlier DNA discoveries linked Tanak to Joe's body, but they're not conclusive. Police need a breakthrough or they may have to release him. An intense search of the car that he drives yields results. One of the CSIs identified some microscopic areas of blood in the boot of that car. They were swabbed and they were sent to the laboratory. And the DNA contributed to that blood was Joanna Yates. When he was subsequently challenged for the interview process and we disclosed the forensic evidence linking him to her body, he still went no comment and the initial indications from the computer of what he'd been viewing, then clearly the evidential case was even stronger and he was in a very difficult position then, but he still chose to say nothing. Police are gathering evidence against the bag that he still refuses to admit that he played a part in the murder of Joanna Yates until a meeting whilst in custody. When he was on remand at uh, Long Larton Prison, on the 8th of February, he disclosed to a, a chaplain at the prison that he was going to plead guilty to the killing of Joe. Vincent Tabak may well have now admitted that he killed Joanna, but he had not confessed to murder. On his laptop, police uncover revealing internet searches about the nuances of English law. He was already devising a plan for how he could get off with a lesser offence. And he was researching, both at work and on his personal laptop, the differences between murder and manslaughter. Vincent Tamak intended to argue that he killed Joanna Yates by accident. I don't think any of us in the prosecution team could conceive of a situation where somebody um, who is a foot taller and an awful lot stronger and bigger than Joe would have accidentally put his hands around her throat and throttled her for about 20 seconds until she collapsed. We felt we was, he was trying it on. He, he, I think he, he felt that, um, well, with the cost cutting that goes, you know, hearing about the newspapers and so forth, they'd take the easy option mm -hmm. Joan for a few years. We had nothing to lose. He, he had nothing to lose by it. Um, because the evidence that the police had, the DNA evidence, uh, meant that he killed Joe, so he's only admitting what the police knew anyway. Claiming manslaughter means a complicated trial, as Joanna's family, Greg, the police and the prosecution, hear his version of offence for the first time. During the course of the trial, he claimed that as he was walking past the, the kitchen window of flat one, that he saw Joe Yates in the kitchen and that they waved to each other and that she in some way had invited him in. But when he was asked to um, show how Joe waved to him from the window, he actually did a wave and not a beckon. I mean, we, he was obviously in the witness box and we watched him. And, uh, and I thought, well, that's, if that ever happened, it's just a wave like that to someone who's walked past the window that you sort of recognise. It wasn't a, a beckon at all. And when he actually did it, he didn't do that. That's what he claimed during the trial. And that she opened the door and he came into the premises. And then they chatted for 10 to 15 minutes in the kitchen. And she made a flirtatious comment to him. And he went to try to kiss her. He'd obviously been reading books of some particular type and, or, or been looking at some videos and that's what's happened. And he thought, well, if it happens in the video, then it probably could happen. But I'm sure he's got no experience of trying to... Um, uh, what's Inter word? Socially interact with, socially with um, women or females or... At that level. I don't think so. He says she 
uh, didn't like what he was doing. She screamed in order to stop her. He put his hand over her mouth. When he took his hand away, she screamed again. And it's then that he replaced his hand and he strangled her. As she, he claimed, he didn't intend to kill her. He claimed that he panicked. But they weren't the actions of somebody that was panicking. His defence that it was a failed pass gone wrong, that he'd unintentionally killed Joanna was to be put before the jury. Was it manslaughter or murder? Any trial, when you're waiting for the, um, particularly a homicide murder trial, when you wait for the verdict of a jury, then your heart starts racing. You have a knot in the stomach whilst you're waiting for that verdict. After deliberating for two and a half days, the jury at Bristol Crown Court rejected Tabak's defence and found him guilty of the murder of Joanna Yates. He was sentenced to life with a minimum tariff of 20 years. But the important thing was the tag of murderer rather than manslaughter. Murder is quite specific. Manslaughter is sort of ambiguous. There was nothing ambiguous about what Vincent Tabak had done. He put her hand around her throat and he squeezed and he squeezed the life out of her. Some experts believe that Tabak was a serial killer in the making. He does present a very unusual profile to be a one offence killer when he is this organised and this systematic and this apparently um, emotionally disconnected from the tragedy that he has caused. It must have planned it. Not necessarily with Joe, but had this plan in his head and then the opportunity arose. Joanna planted a mini garden outside her flat in Canning Road. One resident still tends to the flowers and herbs that she will never see. She was just a lovely girl. We could um, spend time together and not talk and be really happy or just chatter away. And I do miss her. And hopefully, um, when I think of her, I'll be able to be happier, but currently I haven't got through to that bit yet. Our grief really is towards what was taken away from her, not, not what we've lost, but what was taken away from her, because she put a lot of sacrifices to achieve what she had done. And I just wish that she had a chance to sort of reap the benefits of what she put together. It was a delightful girl, an absolute delight, and it's very difficult to think that you're never going to see this person, you're never going to hear this person's voice, and all that you've got to remember them by is what they, what exists at the moment, there's nothing for tomorrow. And um, that's, very, that's very difficult. I think she always, she'd always say to anybody who had any problems, it'll be fine. Mm. And that was it, it'll be fine. Yeah. That's all, that's all that um, I think most people needed to hear from Joe. They had confidence <laughs> that mm. it would be fine, it'll be alright. Yeah. One day before the guilty verdict on Vincent Tabak, the most notorious child killer in British history was convicted of his fourth murder. Taggart's John Mishy opens the file on Robert Black, new and exclusive to CI next Thursday night at nine. Next to Catch a Predator. <laughs>